Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to uh, introduce you formally, at least uh, all of us together, uh, your next Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, and your next U.S. Senator uh, from the state of California, Alex Padilla. Before uh, I introduce uh, the two of them more formally, we have a chance to dialogue and, of course, answer any questions that you may have. I thought it important just to begin uh, with a quick update on where we are in this pandemic, particularly in light of the fact that 361 individuals we reported in the last 24 hours lost their lives uh, to this disease, one of the highest uh, reported death totals uh, since the beginning of this pandemic. On Monday, we announced that we were down to 2.5% ICU capacity as a state. And that's again in the aggregate. Each and every part of the region uh, is in a different condition, experiencing different uh, conditions as it relates to ICUs and hospital admissions. But as a state today, uh, we are down to 1.1% ICU capacity. I remind people that even as we get down to 0% has been the case in Southern California and San Joaquin Valley. That doesn't mean we eliminate ICU capacity. We're now just in the surge capacity, but as a state, as we speak, 1.1% ICU capacity. We had 39,069 cases that we are reporting over the last 24 hour period. Uh, and we've experienced, not surprisingly, a rapid rate of rise in terms of not just the positivity rate, which is now at 12.3%. That's the highest 14-day total that we've experienced since the beginning of this pandemic, 12.3%. Uh, but the seven-day is slightly higher at 12.6%. I want to talk about that in a moment, but first I just want to put in context what's happened just over the course of last three weeks and give you a sense of how dynamic uh, and virulent this disease is. Uh, just consider uh, when we met just three weeks ago, December 1st, uh, we had roughly 2,000 individuals in our ICU uh, that were COVID positive patients. So 2006 to be exact. Today we have 3,827, almost double in just three weeks, the total number of patients from December 1st to December 22nd three weeks, almost double the total number of positive patients that are in our ICUs. Our ICUs currently 55.4% of all of our patients in our ICUs now have tested positive uh, for the coronavirus. Consider the hospitals, 8,517 individuals uh, were in our hospitals that had tested positive for COVID-19 on December 1st. Now 18,000 828. So more than double the total number of positive patients in just three weeks have entered into our hospital system. Hospitals now are represented with COVID positive patients uh, with 33.5% uh, total number of patients that are admitted within the hospital system. So 55.4% of ICUs now have positive patients. 33.5% of our hospitals. Again, these numbers are all in the aggregate. And I want to remind people, it's incredibly important to be mindful that each hospital is unique and distinctive, not just each region in the state. And so we have hospitals with 70 plus percent of our patients that are COVID positive. Some hospitals where just 30% uh, of our ICU patients are COVID positive. And so we are trying to distinguish for that. We're trying to work through those nuances, those unique complexities as it relates to staffing needs, as it relates to our strategies to decompress uh, those hospitals, not just regions within and around the state. Though that said, uh, just two days ago, we updated you on the four alternative care sites that we have stood up, pulled off warm status, uh, now Porterville and Fairview uh, down in Imperial, and of course, the uh, sleep train arena up in Sacramento. We are bringing a fifth alternative care site out of warm status. We're standing up that site, an FMS site down in San Diego. 
Uh, we have, as of yesterday, 951 state staff at 91 facilities in 25 counties uh, that are supplementing, augmenting, and supporting our, our local health officers and the local health needs. Again, we have more requests out to the federal government. We should expect uh, and indeed, we are anticipating uh, some more support uh, from HHS uh, later into this week and into the weekend. We continue uh, to encourage people to take a look at uh, their status and consider their status and their relationship to uh, their unique expertise and the needs in the state to go to the health core uh, site and go to covid19.ca.gov. Uh, and learn more about Health Corps and how you can contribute your talents, your time and energy to help us through this very, very difficult uh, surge on top of a surge that at peril could be a surge on top of a surge on top of a surge unless we are cautious and mindful about our travel plans this holiday season and about our proximity to people outside of our households, the duration of time that were with people outside our households and the importance of maintaining a mindfulness around social and physical distancing, hygiene and mask wearing. It's just incumbent upon us. Again, at peril, we'll be in a surge on top of a surge where we are today, on top of yet again, another surge in the middle and latter part of January and February because of uh, Kwanzaa, because of Christmas and because of New Year and this extended period where we tend to spend more, not less time uh, with family uh, during this holiday season. Here's something though I wanna go back to before we go to uh, what I hope brought many of you uh, to this presentation and that's the two individuals I'm about to introduce. But I wanna just to briefly go back to that 12.6% seven day positivity rate. I noted that we have a high of 12.3% positivity over a 14 day period. The seven day period uh, at 12.6% is actually not a high. It's actually declined slightly in the last number of days. That's an encouraging sign. I wanna leave you with some positive sign. We were at 13.3% uh, just a few days ago, 13.3, 13.3, uh, and now dropping down to 12.6%. We are experiencing uh, a modest decline in the rate of the growth that we were experiencing over the course of the last number of weeks. So again, I, I don't, you know, one, two, three days doesn't necessarily make a trend. That trend doesn't necessarily um, um, warrant a headline, but it's a modest indication uh, of a possible sign of some good news. But again, uh, we have to be mindful of what we're walking into over the course of the next number of days uh, into uh, Christmas holiday season more broadly defined. And so I just wanted to lead with that uh, and remind you again, number uh, that I began with, that, that, that devastating number of 361 families that have been torn apart, lives lost, families that will not be with their loved ones this holiday season, the inability to make a phone call to wish someone well uh, and to get someone on the other end of that call. This disease remains deadly. This pandemic remains deadly. And the virulency of this disease self-evidently you're seeing as it relates uh, to the mutation around the world now, not just in the UK, uh, we're seeing now uh, that mutation appearing in other parts of the globe uh, only reinforces the importance, the imperative of our individual actions, the collective actions, the common sense that we need to bring into this holiday season as we appropriately celebrate this holiday season. Remind people, and forgive me for the extended point, and we'll now turn it over here in a second, um, that it's important to address your mental health. Uh, it's important to be mindful in every way, shape, or form, uh, to, to get fresh air, to, to do as much as you can outdoors um, and, uh, and, and to get exercise uh, and, uh, and check in on people you love, check in on yourself uh, and, and be there even if you can't be physically there for those in need. And so again, more and more outdoor focus, outdoor activity, exercise, mindfulness, um, be more sensitive, perhaps now 
as supportive as you possibly can be uh, to not only friends, family, but even to strangers. And this is the holiday season. And I saw so many of my staff members yesterday out there contributing their time and attention to Cal Volunteers. You can learn how you can volunteer on the Cal Volunteers site or go to that covid19.ca.gov website and learn how you could volunteer at food banks uh, and other safe volunteering opportunities. It's also a big part of the communitarian spirit, which is part of the holiday spirit as well. Final update, 128,210 128, doses of the vaccine have been formally administered so far to date in the state. That's numbers from yesterday. Uh, so they lag a little bit, uh, but you get a sense of the flywheel uh, where we are getting these vaccines uh, and we are getting them out and increasingly into remote and rural parts of the state, always mindful of equity and always mindful of where you are in the queue at two o'clock today, between two and we believe is four, two to four, uh, we have our guidelines advisory committee meeting publicly. You can tune in on the covid19.ca.gov website. The advisory committee is meeting with the guidelines work group on plan 1B, and that's the next cohort that will be prioritized to get more vaccines. First cohort of the 128,000, again, healthcare workers and those in congregate facilities. The next phase includes essential workers and includes food workers and includes a much broader universe of individuals, including seniors 75 and over that public discussion uh, will be held two o'clock today. So forgive me again, the long windedness, Thought it was important to uh, to update all of you on those important uh, statistics and data, uh, but also to now take advantage a little bit of, of this you know exciting moment in, in at least California history and policy, not just politics. Two extraordinary people uh, that I've known for many many years, and two people I've admired from afar uh, when I only knew them uh, professionally and through. Uh, their reputation and their extraordinary hard work. I, I'll begin uh, by introducing and asking uh, Alex Padilla, your current Secretary of State, uh, who we announced yesterday uh, will be uh, the next U.S. Senator from the state of California when uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris is sworn in uh, to the United States Senate after she's sworn in. Uh, uh, Alex Padilla uh, will have that privilege of serving uh, the remainder of her term as representative of the state of California to the United States Senate. Uh, many of you know Alex well. Uh, I've known Alex for years and years and years. Uh, I knew him again reputationally uh, as the youngest uh, president of the city council down in Los Angeles. I think he was just 25 or 26 uh, years young uh, when he ascended that position to his incredible work that he did as a state senator uh, here in Sacramento, representing uh, his district down in the Los Angeles region. Uh, the credible work he has done, not just as uh, Secretary of State over the course of many, many years, but truly in contemporary terms, as of late, uh, conducting this historic election, which he did magnificently, this all mail-in ballot election supplemented uh, with in-person voting uh, opportunities, the work he's done to improve accessibility, transparency, and the accountability within the Secretary of State's office, his partnerships his, uh, with the community as well as his partnerships uh, with the legislature also have not gone unnoticed. Person of character, decency, integrity, great intellect, MIT after all, uh, and, uh, and someone I, I have called as a friend uh, and a wonderful family man as well. And so it's a great pleasure and privilege uh, to introduce you uh, the next U.S. Senator from the state of California, Alex Padilla. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor. It's uh, uh, still sinking in, but uh, excited and eager for this next chapter and opportunity to, to make you proud and make all Californians proud to fight for us. Uh, in the U.S. Senate. So again, thank you for this. It's a tremendous honor uh, and, and I'm humbled by it. Uh, uh, first things first for uh, the folks who uh, saw how that uh, now viral video started. 
that you and I talking about uh, our kids jumping up and down in the back. Uh, thankfully, Angela has heeded your advice to take them outside <laughs> and go get some exercise. So we got a few minutes of quiet uh, in the house right now. But, uh, you know, and also want to kind of point out that, uh, uh, man, you, you knew how to pull my heartstrings when you asked me the question the other day. And while the, the video snippets uh, only make a quick reference to my folks, I did want to share a little bit more uh, for uh, uh, everybody's benefit and why that means so much to me. Uh, you know, my parents came to the United States from Mexico, as, as millions have, right? This is an American dream story, not unique to the Padilla family. Uh, my father, with a very limited education, uh, spent 40 years in a kitchen working as a as a short order cook. Uh, and for the same 40 years, my mom used to clean houses. Uh, she was the lucky one. She had a chance to finish grade school before going to work to help her family. And to think that uh, it's through their sacrifice and struggle and hard work, uh, they raised three children. They have an older sister who's been in education for many years from TA to teacher to principal and now working for the Los Angeles Unified School District and a younger brother who works for uh, uh, city council president in Los Angeles. So we're all in public service, and that's not a coincidence. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it uh, hits home because of the struggle and sacrifice I saw growing up. I see it in so many families uh, trying to live their American dream uh, and struggling to do so. Uh, and that was prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Right? The pandemic has only uh, exacerbated what, uh, what we think of uh, who's an essential worker, who's not. Uh, we see who has the luxury of being able to work remotely versus who isn't, uh, who's been able to, to keep their job versus who's been laid off. Uh, we have some families struggling with this homeschooling uh, environment versus those that may have better digital literacy or access skills. And so all that is not lost in me because I can relate. And I think it's an important perspective to bring uh, short term to the next uh, uh, iterations of COVID relief and stimulus uh, coming out of Congress in the new year. I know they just recently acted uh, on a measure to support families and uh, some small businesses, but uh, it's helpful for now, but the end of the pandemic is nowhere near. The vaccines are rolling, as you mentioned, Governor, uh, but uh, by the time we reach critical mass in terms of its distribution, uh, we need to make sure it's equitable distribution because we know which communities and uh, which individuals are uh, more predisposed at higher risk, either of contracting COVID or to suffer more severe impacts of COVID. You know, all this is, is complex, but in important perspective to bring uh, to a, a short-term COVID response by, by Congress, uh, but also to keep in mind as we tackle some of the longer-term issues, like making sure everybody has access to quality health care, making sure that we not only tackle climate change globally, but address environmental justice uh, along the way, and that we make our democracy and our economy more inclusive. So again, just want to thank you tremendously for, for this opportunity, uh, make you proud by being a fierce advocate for working families throughout the state of California. Angela, uh, the boys and I just uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you again for the honor, and uh, I'm re ready to get to work. And if you'll indulge me just a few words in Spanish, I know there's some Spanish language press uh, that are tuning in. Quiero tomar esta oportunidad de darle las gracias al gobernador por la confianza que ha puesto en mí, eh, nombrándome como el próximo senador federal para representar California, el primer latino en la historia de California para representarnos en el Senado uh, Federal. Uh, con orgullo uh, y humildad voy a traer la, mi experiencia, la experiencia de mi, de mi familia, mis uh, padres inmigrantes a este país que trabajaron tanto, han sacrificado tanto para realizar su sueño americano. Y sé que hay millones de familias haciendo lo mismo, trabajando duro, tratando de contribuir a este país, a la economía y a la sociedad, uh, sufriendo tiempos difíciles uh, debido a la pandemia. Uh, crean uh, y tengan confianza que voy a llevar esta experiencia, este punto de vista a cada negociación, cada acción uh, en el Congreso como su senador federal comenzando en enero. Uh, muchísimas uh, gracias, uh, gobernador. Thank you again, Governor. Uh, appreciate it so much. And uh, great selection on Secretary of State. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to handing the baton off to a civil rights and voting rights champion. Uh, but I'll let you make the formal introduction. I love it. Uh, but it's a great segue. And, and, and again, thank you for, uh, well, thank you for being, uh, you know, being willing to put yourself 
out there at this critical moment and in this critical time in history. And also, thank you, as you were just noting, making history as well. I, I say this is always a point of pride. California is the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. 27% of the state uh, in the last census was uh, was identified as foreign born, 27%, a majority minority state. Uh, it's a point of pride, our capacity to live and advance together across every conceivable difference. But we never had uh, a Latino uh, U.S. Senator, and, and and you will be that first. And, and we are indeed proud of that. It's long overdue. Uh, but with the spirit of, of firsts in mind and the spirit of advancing the cause, as you rightfully identify, which is the cause that has been um, uh, a big part of Dr. Shirley Weber's life, the issues of economic justice, racial justice, social justice, environmental justice, uh, rights broadly defined. Um, it's a remarkable moment as well, a first in history of an African-American uh, woman who's now the next secretary, will certainly be the next secretary of state, a first in California's history, but someone who's well known because she's well defined as a fierce advocate uh, for the voiceless, as someone uh, who formerly uh, was in a role of incredible influence and authority as a professor at San Diego State, someone who served as a school board member, eventually, of course, service in the California legislature, out front and the leading and cutting edge of legislation, but legislation that was tough legislation that others didn't want to take on, legislation that often fell short, but was never denied because of Dr. Weber's commitment, her resolve, her passion, her conviction, uh, and her character as well. Another extraordinary life story uh, and another extraordinary human being. I, I'm so privileged, so blessed to have uh, been, you know, just momentarily being put in this position uh, to be able to uh, ask you, Alex, to pass that baton uh, to Dr. Weber as the next uh, Secretary of State. And so it's with that, I'll pass now the proverbial mic and turn it over to the next Secretary of State of California, Dr. Shirley Weber. Thank you, Governor, and, and thank you, Alex, as well. Um, I, I wanna thank you, Governor, for this uh, very unique opportunity that I have to basically begin um, uh, a new chapter in my life and a new chapter in the life of my family in terms of advocating for the beliefs that we've had all our lives with regards to um, uh, the right of individuals to, to have everything they need, whether it's education, the right to vote, the right to move about and to be free uh, to express the things in their lives that are really important. And I'm just honored that you've asked me to take on this challenge. I wanna congratulate Alex who uh, for years has worked with me in, in, in the in the Capitol with regards to the legislation that we've authored and making sure that uh, the right to vote was always there, not only for the, those who we, we generally give it to, but those who are, had been incarcerated and didn't know they had the right to vote. And he fought along with us on a number of cases to ensure thousands and thousands of individuals to write to vote. So uh, this is an extremely important uh, issue for me. And and um, I'm so grateful. My family is in awe of it. Uh, my brothers and sisters, you know, we came to California because my dad was going to be lynched in Arkansas, Hope, Arkansas. And I always say I'm from Hope, which was a city that had no hope for black people. And my grandfather never got a chance to vote because they didn't. He had died before the Voting Rights Act of, of 1965. And my dad never voted until he came to California in the 50s. And uh, and so that was always important to him, not being able to go to school, uh, having limited education, limited opportunities. Uh, he instilled that in his eight children. He, he made clear that we knew that those things were extremely important, going to school, uh, doing the best you could, but also exercising your right to vote. And so for years on 45th and Broadway, 351 West 45th Street, my house was the polling place of Los Angeles for that particular precinct. My dad was so proud, my mom was so proud, and as a family we knew on election day, go through the back door because people are front voting in the living room. And that was just a part of our culture, that we, we, we valued the vote, and all of my brothers and sisters registered to vote. We continue to vote, our, grand, our kids vote. And so we know that um, voting is important. And so to give, be given the opportunity, um, to be able to somehow or another do things that my family only dreamed about, that my father never thought in his lifetime would ever happen, 
that his daughter would be the person and the secretary of state whose responsibility was to ensure the integrity of voting in California, to make sure that everyone had that right and that right was protected. And so I look at that and I, I and I and, and my, my mother would have been 100 years old this year and my dad. Uh, uh, and so they would have probably just been so proud because of what they instilled in us, this value for education and this value for uh, for the right to vote. And so um, I'm honored. I'm honored to be um, to have been asked to do this. My grandkids are just in awe. You know, they they, they they say there's two people that live in our house. There's their grandmother. And then there's this lady who they say who has power. And that's what my nine year old grandson talks about as he sees what he thinks is the transition that occurs between the grandma who makes the cookies and the woman who stands up and makes the speeches. Uh, but um, I just want to say I'm, I'm very proud to be here. And I um I take this responsibility very seriously because it is a serious position and it has tremendous opportunities for us to uh, to continue the legacy that's been established as California has in these very difficult times where people are challenging uh, the right to vote, challenging our system itself and trying to destroy our democracy, that we have to have folks who believe in it. We have to have folks who stand up for it. And my history and my family knows what it is like when people deny you that right. They know what happens when people challenge the fairness and the transparency of systems. Uh, my family has lived that. And so for me, I am I am always the person who looks at every aspect of freedom and justice and makes sure that we are dotting every I and crossing every T. Because when we get lax and when we forget who we are, we then make ourselves very vulnerable and we destroy the system that has been the, the, the hallmark of trying to create fairness and justice. We're not perfect, but we know that we are striving for a more perfect union. And so I am really honored that you've asked me to be the voice, the administrator, yeah. the person who's a keeper of California's voting rights and its seal and those things that are so central to who we are. And I am eager to to take on this new challenge and know that it will be um, a, a tremendous challenge, but one that I that is part of my soul, part of my spirit. And I thank you so very much. And I wish you, Alex, all the success in Sacramento in, in DC. Uh, I will truly be calling you regularly, not just about SOS, but all the other things that uh, that we want to do for California. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Doctor, and and uh, I. You know, if, uh, if, and I'll turn it over to uh, anybody who has questions here in a moment, uh, but, but I, I, I think if you have a question, as ask me why, I think you, you just found out why uh, I uh, was privileged uh, to offer these positions uh, on the basis of these vacancies uh, to these two extraordinary individuals. And, and for me, again, at the end of the day, uh, of course, competency matters. Uh, of course, um, uh, technical expertise matters, but character matters as well. Uh, good human beings that have a default that is other people oriented, not self uh, oriented. And I, I think these two people uh, are exemplars of that. And, uh, and, and those values uh, have been demonstrable in their careers and will be in these new positions. So I am incredibly humbled, gratified, and uh, and very honored. Thank you both for for the privilege of, of being with us together. And with that, let's uh, turn it over. If anyone has any questions of, of any of us, Jamie Hoar, Associated Press. Um, hey, Governor. Uh, um, I've got uh, two questions here. The health department says it will soon send all facilities led at hospitals in Taiwan start using the types of care desk guidelines. When do you expect hospitals to begin having duration care and under what circumstances? This includes postponing elective procedures, which the state kept voluntary in the spring. Why not make it mandatory given the staffing crisis now? And separately, models for the RFS that show the transmission rate has slowed markedly in the last two weeks. What did that tell you? And are more people heeding calls to change their behavior? Thank you. Yeah, I think the regional stay at home has had an impact. As I say, it's still too early to tell that 13.3% peak that we experienced under the seven day positivity rate now having dropped uh, the fourth day in a row is encouraging. And as you note, they are effective as well, particularly outside of the LA region. Uh, that's a point of some optimism, but still caution 
uh, because the first part of your question is sobering, isn't it? And that's crisis standards of care and the question of when do we adopt it and how do we apply it? Uh, that question was posed uh, to our crisis care advisory committee uh, that was tasked many, many months ago to put out uh, those, those standards of care. Uh, we went through a very uh, deliberative process, a very public process to establish those standards. And yesterday they convened yet again uh, to update their communication uh, and their deliberation on the same. The answer to your question, nuance, is uh, site by site. It's specific. For example, I was talking today to Dr. Galley. We just were comparing census uh, at uh, MLK Hospital down in LA uh, versus uh, Cedar sinai in LA and the unique makeup, the distinctions between the two in terms of population, in terms of those that are admitted in the ICUs and hospitals uh, that are COVID positive. The distinctions within cities, within counties, within regions, uh, which will require a nuance and require more specificity in terms of answering your question of when and how these crisis standards of care are adopted and advanced. Uh, but look, encouraging news on the R effective, uh, still too early to tell. Uh, we are experiencing, we have experienced the surge on top of the surge from Thanksgiving. Uh, and obviously the most important message that we can communicate today uh, is to do everything in our power to mitigate the spread and the transfer of this virus uh, during this very vulnerable period of time because this virus loves social events. This virus thrives in that atmosphere. It thrives indoors, it thrives when there's a lack of ventilation. It thrives when we're proximate to one another. It thrives when we extend the duration of time with people outside of our households. And so we must do everything in our power uh, to mitigate those conditions uh, and to ultimately drive uh, this virus and extend uh, our time and opportunity to administer more doses of the vaccine and to allow for uh, the extension of the time to patient care. And that goes to your final point, forgive me for the long windedness, but three parts of your question. And that is the importance of staffing and the importance of decompressing our hospital system. You referenced it in the context of elected surgeries. I'll broaden it to scheduled surgeries. You're already seeing hospitals, you're seeing systems, you're seeing already based upon trends, based upon the specific conditions that exist and persist or are projected within those systems and hospitals, you're already seeing significant reduction in elected and scheduled surgeries. We are in constant communication with hospital leaders and with the system itself. And so far, we don't feel we need to mandate that as these individuals, these organizations, these leaders are making appropriate choices. We have waivers on staffing, which I know is difficult and stressful, particularly on our extraordinary nurses. Uh, and we've seen those waivers exercised uh, and those staff ratios providing more flexibility. And you're seeing now surge plans, not just on the ICUs, but also we're starting to see the capacity plans that were put into place many, many months ago begin to be put into place as it relates to physical extension of existing spaces on existing hospital footprints, meaning tents starting to go up in and around parking lots, parts of hospitals that were not used for ICUs now being used for ICUs, all the flex planning that's been done over the course of many, many months now starting to take shape in anticipation of this moment, in anticipation of the next few weeks. Tiffany Specker, Bloomberg News. Uh, hi, thank you. This is a question for Secretary Padilla. Um, Mr. Padilla, can you, could you tell us uh, what uh, committees you hope to serve on in the Senate? Uh, are you expected to um, fill Senator Harris's uh, thoughts on those committees? And uh, which ones would you like to, to be on? Yeah, uh, no, great, great question. Uh, as uh, the announcement is still uh, fresh, so is this a uh, transition process. So that's definitely on the list of things to, to think through. Um, but uh, I can uh, offer this. Uh, just yesterday uh, afternoon, did have an opportunity to speak with uh, 
uh, Minority Leader Schumer. Uh, and uh, he just offered his congratulations and we put a pin and some time this weekend to circle back and have those kinds of conversations uh, as well. So uh, I know it's a process. Uh, it'll be a combination of uh, you know committees that uh, not just are, are of interest to me in terms of issues, but more importantly, uh, are the most relevant and impactful for California. And the starting point is looking at where uh, Senator Harris is currently as she's vacating and where Senator Feinstein is, because it's going to be important for both U.S. senators to work uh, as collaboratively and as effectively uh, to deliver for the state. So still, still to be determined, not hiding anything from you, but to, as it evolves, I'll certainly be sharing it at the appropriate time. That's great. Paul, this is San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Uh, I had a question about the, uh, the federal medical stations. I understand that these stations are not equipped to provide intensive care. Um, sounds like there's some sort of step down unit. Uh, so how, how does the state expect these uh, federal medical stations to take pressure off the ICUs uh, if they can't provide ICU care? They ultimately are part of a stack system of care which allows us to decompress, allows us more flexibility within the existing footprints within the hospitals themselves. As I noted, uh, we're starting to see rooms that weren't traditionally used for ICU purpose being repurposed for ICU. Of course, we have pressure then on the incoming with people that are still in hospital beds, not in ICU, not in debated, not necessarily in that acute care need where we can decompress, we can take advantage of these FMS sites, these alternative care facilities, uh, and they come in many different, um, many different flavors, so to speak. Not just the field medical stations, uh, but you've got the old uh, sleep train arena, uh, where we have COVID positive patients that are currently there that are taking pressure off the hospitals in the region. So each Fairview Porterville, each one of these alternative care facilities has a unique contribution that impacts the stacking of prioritizations, patients, and utilization within the existing hospital footprints. The biggest issue remains, and I'll just remind everybody of this, it's staffing. And that's why we remain very aggressive in our posture of requesting support from the Department of Defense. We updated you 48 hours ago on some of those specific asks. Uh, we are actually uh, talking to the incoming administration and their point uh, um, their, their COVID uh, point people about our needs so we can hit the ground running uh, when the new administration is sworn in. We continue to maintain very strong working relationship with uh, the president's office and with the vice president himself, uh, who's been very accommodating as it relates to additional staffing. As you know, Cal, we are providing CalGuard staffing. We're trying to utilize our existing staff as well as the health corps staff in terms of providing uh, additional relief. We also are hopeful, a little bit of a preview, we're hopeful that the holidays for everybody, uh, it makes it difficult because people have uh, already pre-planned their time um, away. Maybe this is their vacation time, maybe it's with their family or loved ones. Uh, and we are hopeful that the first week of January, we'll actually be able to get more contract staff we're able to actually access more staffing uh, at a critical time in a week or so as well. So we're playing away, uh, playing around with all those, um, all those staffing needs. But uh, but the FMS site is really about decompressing the rest of the system. Alex Michelson, Fox Eleven. Uh, thank you, Governor, and, and congratulations uh, to you both. Um, Governor, you mentioned this concept that character counts. In a state with 40 million people, you have a lot of qualified people to choose between. I know you and, and especially Secretary Padilla have been good friends for a long time. Can you reflect on, on what your relationship with each of them, what that's informed you about them as people, and how you think that translates to both your decision-making process and to how the job performance will be going forward? I think, and well, first of all, thank you for that question um, because it's a thoughtful question and it, and it deserves a thoughtful response. You know, you know, the thing that separates, I, I've, I've been doing, I'm former county supervisor, former mayor, two-term lieutenant governor, now governor. 
uh, I've been at this a long time. I've got to know people I've admired, respect from afar, got to know them a little bit better and, and lost a little bit of that admiration because I sensed there was them for them about power and prestige more than it was about doing their job. I think they wanted to be something more than they wanted to do something. What I think, honestly, truly, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be here together. Full stop. If I didn't believe these two individuals were different than that, uh, that they're here to do something, not be something. I've seen it up close. I mean, I've seen it just in contemporary terms with Dr. Weber on a police use of force bill uh, where, you know, it was a year ago that the state established one of the most progressive police use of force bills in the nation. This is before the George Floyd uh, 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 a tragedy. And, 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 and I'd watched Dr. Weber from afar, but I, I had a chance now to work with her directly. And, and, and just the, you, you, characters define in, in one's actions, not just in public, but in private. Her conviction, her congruency wasn't intellectual, it was emotional, but it was also strategic, her ability to get things done, doers, not just dreamers. That's, that's someone of character and someone of conviction and someone whose default is about you and me and others, not just about herself. I've seen it in Alex Padilla for decades where, where we walk the streets together. We, we walk precincts for other causes um, where I've seen it in his interaction with his kids. And that's the true test, someone's character. Uh, it's reflected back in the eyes of their children, his wife, um, the experience we both had. You know, I lost my father a few weeks after he lost his mother two years ago in those conversations. And, and those are very personal and very raw. And you get to, it, someone reveals themselves in those moments. And, and, and of course, his incredible work, this heroic work with the scale of what he just accomplished uh, in terms of this election in the nation's most populous state. Um, again, I, I just, I'm blessed and I think you should feel blessed that we have two remarkable Californians uh, that are now in positions where they can, they, can, they can impact your life, impact our lives, and impact the lives of, of millions and millions of people that frankly, I felt a little forgotten, um, felt like they were not on the front of the line, but the back of the line. And I can't tell you how many people called me um, when they say they saw themselves in that conversation uh, when Alex started talking about his uh, mom and dad. And, and, and that just meant the world to me, just because it means the world to them. Um, and, uh, and I know you all heard that a moment ago with Dr. Weber, uh, that same spirit, same pride that comes through, just knowing that they're going to be now elevated in their positions uh, of influence. Jeremy White, Politico. Hey, uh, Governor and others, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Weber, uh, a lot of folks are curious to know about how your selection um, will play into the 2022 election, given that there are multiple other people who have also already declared Secretary of State campaigns. Uh, so I'm hoping you can tell us if it is your intention to run for re-election in 2022. Yes, it, it is my intention to run for re-election in 2022. Um, I don't take on a task just to be a, a uh, you know someone who holds down the fort while something else is going on. There are a lot of things we started in California in terms of, of voting, and and I was a part of some of those things, and we'll continue that. Um, so I expect you know, we will run a very active and um, aggressive campaign, uh, and while we're also learning the job and and doing some things that are really important that have to be done. So. Uh, I anticipate that uh, I will uh, I will run in 2022 for the position for the full term. Um, there are colleagues who also have an interest in that, and I understand that, and and uh, they have a right to run if they choose to. Uh, but um, but I do plan to run uh, in 2022. And Alex, um, just for the purposes of of answering that question for you as well, what's your intention? Uh, absolutely, you know the uh, big issues, big challenges. Uh, uh, that we're about to tackle, we know, uh, require a, a longer term commitment. So I've been making that uh, signal very clear, not just to you, Governor, but to all Californians. I'm in this uh, for the long haul. So I uh, will uh, look forward to, you know, hitting the ground running quickly, uh, making the case and earning California voter support in 2022. Ashley Zavala, Next Star Media Group. 
Hi, Governor. This week we've seen a lot of other governors uh, get their vaccination shots, and I was wondering when you might be getting yours. Uh, when the guidelines work group makes an independent adjudication as to when uh, I should, when it's appropriate, someone my age uh, of uh, of my vulnerability, whatever that may be, uh, and not before. That's just my personal choice. Um, and I think it's important, and I appreciate. I don't, I don't begrudge those in, in elected office that have. Uh, have gotten the vaccination. In fact, in many ways, I applaud that because it's important to show folks that it's safe and it's efficacious. Uh, but for me, there's just simply too many people that contact me personally and contact my office desperate for the vaccine. And I honestly, in good conscience, I just can't get ahead of them in getting vaccinated. Ben Christopher, Cal Matters. Hi there, thanks so much to all of you for taking the time to take my call. Um, so this is a question for both Secretary Padilla and Dr. Weber. The $35 million contract with SKD Knickerbocker remains uh, unresolved as far as I know. So ultimately, which of the two of you will be responsible for resolving that? And who's going to pay? Where is that money going to come from? Thanks very much. Uh, I'll go first, if that's all right. Um, so a couple of things just to make sure we put the question in the proper context. Uh, what we're referring to is, is a contract to help over, to help run a nonpartisan voter education campaign as we uh, conducted the November general election, which was not only important, uh, it was mandated, uh, written into the Budget Act of 2020, 2021, passed by the legislature, signed by the governor. Uh, we made a lot of changes to how we administer the November election. As we all know, uh, every vote, registered voter in California received a vote by mail ballot, uh, but we still uh, opened in-person voting with all the public health protocols that California voters would not have to choose between exercising their right to vote. Uh, and protecting their health and that of their loved ones. Uh, so voter education was key to letting voters know what those options were. The uh, it's mandated program uh, contract was properly negotiated and entered into, you know, signed off not just by the vendor, but general services and uh, others. The only real question here is which account is it gonna be paid out of? That's where there's uh, uh, some uh, technical questions and, and disagreement that uh, uh, will still be resolved. If we really wanna go into the weeds here, uh, the, the issue of concern for some is whether the Secretary of State's office should have spent some of this funding on behalf of counties overseeing voter education, to which I would remind folks, there's plenty of precedent for that. When uh, uh, the Secretary of State's office uh, streamlined translation of uh, election and voting materials uh, consistent with the Voting Rights Act, for example. Nobody raised any questions, nobody raised any concerns. When we knew we'd have to help coordinate the procurement of PPE for all the in-person voting locations throughout the state of California, that's a gargantuan task in a short amount of time. Uh, we did that on behalf of counties with their full support and appreciation. No problems, no questions, but all of a sudden when it comes to having uh, facilitated voter education so people could participate and stay healthy in November 2020. All of a sudden, now there's a question. I just um, you know, wanted to put your question in the proper context. It will be resolved soon, no doubt. Uh, controller's office, Department of Finance, everybody's uh, sharpening the pencils and, and working it out. And, and Ms. E work it out. Uh, they're very competent. Uh, administrators of in, in their own office. And so I have, I'm confident that they will resolve it. Um, we were not involved, at least personally, I was not. And so I, I am confident that they will handle uh, the issue. And that's very compl complex as he has explained it, uh, that they will handle it. Yeah, and, and just know with, uh, we're working with legislative leadership and finance and, uh, and we'll get that paid. Yeah. Sophia Balog, Sacramento Bee. Sorry, Sophia, we can't hear you. The president signed the economic release bill that Congress has passed. How soon can EDV pay those people their benefits? Well, we, we hope to get those checks out as quickly as possible. It's part of the it's a system now that 
is well defined in terms of the UI being extended for 11 weeks if indeed the president signs it. The additional supplement at $600, though we'd love to see 2,000. I appreciate Speaker Pelosi uh, being willing to take the president at his word. And that, by the way, represents if we, if you see a $2,000 supplemental payment uh, to people in that category, it's upwards of $60 billion that be infused in the state of California versus about 18 billion with those 16 or $600 checks. But our capacity to do that is substantially better than it was because we've been able to significantly address the backlog of cases with the reboot and the ID me system to deal with the vulnerability of fraud uh, in the EDD program, particularly with the PUA, the pandemic unemployment assistance distinguished from the unemployment insurance payments. Uh, so systems set up, we look forward to uh, having clarity uh, and we'll get those supplemental payments out similarly to what we did briefly with those supplemental payments uh, where California did uh, take a leadership position and didn't criticize or critique uh, that support. We actually took advantage of that additional support uh, for a number of weeks with those supplemental payments during the summer, the latter part of the summer. So uh, they're ready to go. We're eager uh, to uh, get the signature from the president, unless indeed he wants to increase those direct payments, which uh, would indeed be encouraging. Patrick Healy, NBC4. Hi, Governor. A uh, quick question um, following up on your comments earlier in the week about the new strain from England. Have you given any further thought to tightening uh, quarantine requirements at the major California hospitals? Uh, as I guess San Francisco and Santa Clara have done on a county basis. Thank you. Yeah, we have. We're looking for a more universal travel policy. So I'm previewing it a little bit for you. Uh, we're very close to uh, making that public. That includes uh, PSAs, it includes uh, information campaign, including um, uh, uh, the pursuit. And this gets more complicated. And it's why we haven't announced it yet, just some in flight. Um, uh, information, some reservation lodging information if you're uh, indeed uh, going to uh, travel for essential business purposes, uh, that there's some confirmation as it relates to travel advisory uh, being abided by. We have uh, an advisory in place, but we are working with local health officers to potentially tighten that up. In addition, I should just note an extension to your question. Uh, we have been in contact with uh, not only Virgin Atlantic, but also Delta and their partnerships. They have the direct flights from Heathrow into LAX. And as you may know, I'm not sure it's universally known, but it seems to have gotten out there that by Thursday tomorrow, uh, they'll be requiring negative tests for all flights, not just on the East Coast, but also here uh, on our coast. And so that's encouraging news as well. So uh, more information coming forthcoming in this space. Answer is yes, we're looking to tighten those travel advisories up. Final question, Brody Lebeck, LA Blade. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, Dr. Weber and Secretary uh, Padilla, um, on behalf of myself as the editor of the Los Angeles Blade and my publisher, congratulations to you both. Secretary Padilla, you have been a longtime ally of our community. So this is really cool to see you in the Senate seat. Um, Dr. Weber, I have a quick question for you. Governor Newsom in this last election cycle working with Secretary uh, Padilla did um, just a massive job of getting mail, um, the mail-in ballots out to California voters. Participation was incredibly high. But one of the areas that, of course, is going to be of overriding right concern and continuing concern will be, of course, our minority voters in the state of California, uh, particularly in our black and brown communities, as well as our LGBTQ communities. Um, have you given any thought to continuing on the initiatives of Secretary Padilla, uh, as, as he has already laid out, uh, and, and further guide support from Governor Newsom? And again, congratulations to you both. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, the good thing is I, I, I once chaired the election committee uh, in the assembly and I still serve on the elections and redistricting committee. So many of the uh, ideas and, and new plans that uh, Mr. Padilla put in place came through our committee. 
And I supported those efforts to, to talk about everyone getting a, uh, a mail-in ballot and to working with the various minority communities to ensure that they would vote, to make sure our, our high school students were being registered early and all those kinds of things. I've worked on those things with Mr. Padilla. He's come to San Diego. We've done some um, meetings together at high schools and various places. So, um, so I'm very supportive of what we did. I'm very proud of, of the election that took place, that the new things were put in place. We want to surely increase um, of that participation. I think, uh, you know, uh, getting out there and making sure that all of the communities, the ethnic communities, as well as others to know that they have, a, um, they have various options for voting is really, really important. And so I've been very pleased with what we saw with the last election as a member of our election committee uh, in, the, in the assembly. We'll hope to be able to uh, look at what we've done, may expand on it, make it even better. Uh, and we've seen record turnouts in voting and every, every Californian should be excited about what we've done because I can remember, I can remember the times when we were praying for 50% of the people to vote or 40% or 30, or I'd look at certain communities and it'd be 20%. And I spent most of my time in the assembly pushing my district, particularly the 79th, a very diverse district, to make sure that we were always up there in terms of voter turnout. So uh, I'm excited about the fact that we figured it out. We're beginning to figure out most of it and that we work on a time when we will have as, as much excitement as we had this year, if not more around voting. Uh, that is extremely important. And there was a period of time when it was just ho-hum, here we come, an election day. And now people are excited about it and voting a week in advance and two weeks. That's what we need to do. Uh, I remember when South Africa had its first election and we were just in awe of the people wrapped around the buildings wanting to vote for a week or two. And, 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 and that was what the past Passion was missing in California and in this nation. So we're restoring it now. You know, record numbers of people voting across the country. We should be ecstatic that these folks finally realize just how important this democracy is, just how important their vote is, and that every Californian, every person in this nation who is eligible to vote should go to vote. So uh, I, yes, I, I embrace what we've done. And we hope to be able to expand on it so that we at some point will have 100 percent of all of our registered voters actually voting in every election. That's my goal. You know, you you shoot for it and, and you get at least they say if you shoot for the moon, you get off the ground. And that's what we plan to do. I love that. Hey, Alex, you want to just uh, you want to build on that a little bit? Let's get you off mute. There we go. Ten, 10 months of quarantine still good. I got to remember to unmute. <laughs> um, no, look, I, I think we have tremendous momentum uh, going that I have no doubt uh, uh, soon to be Secretary Weber will continue to build on. I'll just uh, uh, call out a couple of uh, things that uh, have been part of the foundation now. Number one, a very low key bill that went through the legislature a couple of years ago was signed into law now makes adds to the official duties and responsibilities of the secretary of state uh to increase participation rates right what a concept mm -hmm. uh, prior to that bill of course the chief elections officer oversees the proper administration of elections but there was no statutory mandate that you increase participation rates well now there is and specifically that language includes a special uh consideration for uh communities that have uh, historically been underrepresented uh, and so that should be driving uh, the initiatives and the efforts for uh, the, the current Secretary of State administration and future administrations. And by the way, future legislatures can uh, call uh, those questions to see how those are being pursued. I'll give you another example. The tremendous success of automatic voter registration through DMV. The reason I think that's a, a profoundly powerful part of the legacy I'm glad to, uh, to, to have you know, prior to that, if you're eligible to vote in America today, but not registered, you don't get the state's voter information guide. If you're eligible to vote in America, but not registered, you don't get your county sample ballot. If you're eligible to vote in America, but uh, not registered, chances are candidates and campaigns are not knocking on your door or calling you during dinner. Uh, so the sheer systematic adding of previously eligible but unregistered voters to the rolls creates a lot of that activity. And, and by the way, it's not just about numbers. Who is it that's disproportionately eligible but unregistered? It's been working class families. It's been communities of color. It's been a lot of young people. And those are the voices that we have disproportionately uplifted 
through these reforms in the last several years. So I appreciate the spirit of the question. I think we've done a lot in the last six years, uh, but uh, until we hit 100 percent, you know, always more to do. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, Shirley Weber will uh, bring that same philosophy and, and passion to this office. Here, here. Well, I not only appreciate the spirit of the question, I appreciate the spirit of uh, the last hour. And, and again, thank you to Dr. Weber and thank you to Alex Padilla for all of their, um, well, their public service and all of their extraordinary work and leadership to date. And uh, we're confident the best is yet to come. And, uh, and I'll just close by reminding folks that they wish to tune in in an hour, two o'clock at the covid19.ca.gov website, learn more about our next uh, phase of distribution of the vaccine, our plan 1B, that will be publicly discussed. Um, and uh, I just wanna close by just making point, uh, a personal point uh, that I think in the appointment of, uh, of Alex Padilla, we've also proven another paradigm, and that is the willingness of this governor to work with people, even Dodger fans, in terms of elevating uh, and to positions like you have said it. Oh, geez, you're rubbing it in further. <laughs> anyway, by the way, this is a big deal geographically as well. Dr. Weber, San Diego, Alex Padilla, Los Angeles. I know a lot of folks have had you know, there's a lot of Northern Californians uh, statewide. So this is a nice, nice thing as well. Governor, if I can add just one last thing, um, you know, appreciate what you said in terms of uh, Secretary Weber's and, and my uh, uh, qualifications individually, but I do think it's important for uh, everybody to observe. Uh, part, part of your vision and selection is not just our individual uh, preparation, but our commitment to working together, right? That's what all Californians deserve quality uh, individual leaders, but just as importantly, elected leaders working together on their behalf. And I know that's uh, what you and I have, what Dr. Weber uh, has, and uh, you know, just a testament to you to uh, keep all trains uh, moving in the same direction to help California families. Yeah, and full disclosure, just, and forgive us, we'll, 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 we'll zoom off here in a second, but I love, right when you, we both came on, Dr. Weber, we were just talking, you're already engaged with, with Alex on, on transition issues. And again, we, we were commenting, isn't it great that you guys have a longstanding relationship? You've worked together on so many elections related bills for years and years. And I appreciate that, Alex, the, the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. Well, thank you all. Yes, appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Be safe.